The Prime Minister calls for a global framework that facilitates developing nations. The Senate President supports the idea of permanent secretaries being declared deputy ministers. The former COVID monitors at schools will be retained but in a different role. And in sports, Kings topple the Warriors to secure a playoff berth in the CPL. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. Good evening, I'm Pearson Boeing. The Group of 77 Plus China Summit kicked off in Cuba with Barbados calling for solidarity in the push for a digital world. Prime Minister Mia Amar Motley, who was accompanied by Minister of Foreign Affairs Kerry Simmons, joined some 30 heads of state and governments from the Caribbean, Africa, Asia and Latin America at the two-day summit in Havana. Ms. Motley told leaders the absence of policy space and inadequate finance are impeding the ability of countries to provide opportunities for their citizens, especially in the area of science and technology. The summit was held under the theme, Current Development Challenges, the Role of Science, Technology and Innovation. It aims to evaluate and debate the main challenges and core issues of the development of the nations of the South. There will be an expansion exponentially of power and a consolidation of wealth for those who have access. But there is a dangerous part, because apart from nation states, the rise of individual titans and the rise of multinational corporations, whose balance sheets dwarf the majority of the world's states, now put us in a precarious position if we do not act with solidarity and with purpose. As nation states, we cannot choose between investment in food and shelter and rebuilding from climate crises rather than investing in education and technology and science. We need the policy space, we need the finance, and we need the commitment to work together to overcome these hurdles if there is to be a last stand in the name of the majority of the world's people. The Barbadian leader wants countries to use science and technology tools as instruments of empowerment and not tools of oppression. Science and technology is not to be allowed to run amok. In an unregulated global environment, we need equally to appreciate what must be done in terms of accountability and transparency by our multilateral institutions and through domestic legal enforcement if we are not to see the undermining of our democracies and the unraveling of progressive opportunities for development. My friends, there can be no more appropriate place, Miguel, for us to have met in this meeting today. Your country has been one of the true beacons of the global south and of the developing world with respect to innovation through science and technology. President of the Senate, His Honor Reginald Farley, has voiced support for public sector reform that would embrace having permanent secretaries declared as deputy ministers. The matter was brought to the fore as a possible model for Barbados during the latest meeting of the Parliamentary Reform Commission held last night at the Lestavon School. The discussion focused on the Cabinet of Barbados, the role of ministers and their relationship with Parliament. In the minister of Canada, in Canada, they refer to their permanent secretaries as deputy ministers. And in truth and in fact, I used to approach my ministry with that in mind because when you have titles which are so far different, sometimes you could think that one is from Venus and the other is from Mars. And I used to always see my PS as my deputy minister. We're in this together, we're partners. And I was always say, you are the one to tell me if I'm talking nonsense, if I'm going crazy. You know, let, let us let us treat to have that kind of relationship. As far as um, so, whether but, the, but whether the title has changed or not, it is more how the function is performed. But I think that if in the course of public sector reform, the experts in that area deem that some title changes may help with that aspect of the reform and the work, that, that's fine by me. But I, I wouldn't advocate for it one 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 way or the other.
Senator Farley reassured Barbados has systems in place to keep the parliamentary executive in line. He notes that from time to time within various parliaments in the Commonwealth, action was taken against the executive after losing the confidence of the parliament. Security of tenure for cabinet ministers was also discussed. Ministers of government, even though you cannot work for anybody else, you're treated for purposes of national insurance as self-employed. So you pay national insurance at the self-employed rate, which also means that you cannot claim unemployment. So the simple matter to that would not be a matter of government paying anything, government giving any gratuity, anything sort. It would be a simple matter of, of the parliament changing the, the, well, the, the, the change being made to recognize that cabinet ministers are really employees of the crown, they can't do other work, and as opposed to self-employed persons. Former Attorney General Adriel Brathwood wants training opportunities for those who aspire for political office, including those called to serve as cabinet ministers. He pointed to the lack of experience, noting it's the first job where, as head of an organization, no training is provided. If you have an opposition party um, or any political party who has an interest in, in, in gaining government, that, that in fact that they can appoint a shadow cabinet and ensure that those persons who aspire for political office can, can receive the requisite training so that if and when there's a transition, that the learning curve is, is reduced um, significantly. The other side of the coin is, is that it's a, also the only position that the chief executive officer isn't evaluated. And, and I believe that the time has come where indeed, um, whether quarterly or yearly, um, that in fact that ministers are subjected by the Prime Minister um, to a, a review. The former COVID monitors who were worried about their roles this new school year have been retained but with a different title and responsibilities. Acting Prime Minister Santia Bradshaw says the 220 who were deployed at the nursery, primary and special schools assisted greatly and Cabinet has taken the decision to retain them. We also recognize that some of them during the period were inspired to go and um, take up courses in childcare. Um, many of them got very glowing reports from the principals as well, indicating that there was clearly a need um, for us to create a, a, a position within the, the Ministry of Education that would allow for the continuation um, of their role, even if in a different way. As a consequence, the, the Cabinet has agreed that those 220 monitors that were deployed across the nursery, the primary and the um, special needs institutions of this country, that those persons will now transition to a position referred to as a school assistant. Ms. Bradshaw says they will assist the teachers in various ways. The acting Prime Minister also provided an update on the Fruitful Hill project, which a number of former Ashfall workers are on. They've been retrained and are helping with the roadworks projects in the Scotland district. We were able to deploy a number of Gabion workers onto the site. Um, the designs are ongoing in terms of the layouts of the lands to ensure that the area is safe. And those teams have started back on the site. Um, Obviously, there were some challenges we had at all of the locations in relation to Gabians. Mm -hmm. um, Gabians were not easily accessible, particularly during the COVID period. And even after COVID, um, we, we still had challenges in terms of getting a lot of the materials into the country. Uh, the truth is, and Mr. Trudeau can back me on this, we, we've had to sometimes barter with the Chinese, the Complant team, where we have loaned them um, our Gabians because they are bringing Gabians into the country as well, and that has taken a lot of time. We'll take a break here, but coming up, another clean and green space launched. The 68th clean and green space was launched this morning at the Barbados Community College. The aim is to further enhance the environment of the college and allow for biodiversity to take place. This site will allow for persons in a recreational area to balance their humors. It's very important that the environment must interfuse itself with 
the social dynamics that we are faced with. And I said post-COVID that there are a lot of distress that persons are faced with daily. We know the stressors. We know the, the, the financial implications of post-COVID. That those stressors, you, at, at the end of the day, you need an outlet. And there's no better outlet than appreciating a natural environment. And I call it balancing the humors. Other people may call it other things. In reminding the students about the causes associated with global warming, climate change and biodiversity, all of which will affect or are affecting Barbados, Minister Ford offered a solution in the form of tree planting and implored each BCC student to plant a tree. We produce about 2 million tons of carbon dioxide at harmful greenhouse gas every single year. But you know with a million trees, and I must say I want to thank or based on the tree planting effort, for planting so far, almost 100,000 trees. Because a million trees at adult stage will be down to about 48 million pounds of carbon dioxide being sequestered from the atmosphere. It will help prevent that powerful greenhouse gas from destroying the ozone there as we know it. The simple notion of planting a tree. So I encourage each and every one of you to go with equal gusto and zeal and plant a tree. Not only plant it, but care for it because it will be done to your very small level. Chairman of the college, Dr. Allison Leacock, is confident that the clean and green environment will be maintained by the college students. That we will ensure this campus, which is already a beautifully situated campus, will be maintained and sustained as a beautiful green campus. We're in a community and we can demonstrate by our leadership that how we keep this campus will mushroom into the community. The transformation taking place in the world of work has the focus for the midterm delegates conference of the Congress of Trade Unions and Staff Associations. Wendy Burt tells us when they met under the theme building and transforming the labor movement in a transformative age, many stakeholders were in agreement with an open conversation on these matters. The role of the Congress was seen as critical to the social dialogue which must take place on issues of climate change and technology such as AI because of its impact on the workforce. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Labour, Social Security and Third Sector, Sharon Drayton, says SIDUSAM facilitates social dialogue, especially in responding to new issues. Concerns such as the impact of technology, climate change, sustainable development, gender issues, violence, and harassment at work, which are becoming more important, will be part of the social dialogue. Anne Reed of the Barbados Private Sector Agency says the theme is on point given circumstances faced today and with life evolving, the workforce must be able to adapt. We're going through digital changes seemingly at a faster pace after COVID-19. Artificial intelligence, I'm sure this word is gonna come up very often today, is reshaping industries and the job market around the world, not just in Barbados. This transformation brings about both opportunities and challenges. Therefore, it is important that both the private sector and the labor movement adapt and evolve in a manner to better equip our workforce and by extension Barbados Sedusan President Edwin O'Neill announced his retirement from the organization at the midterm session. He says he's had high and low points, but the return of a May Day rally is a plus, particularly going back to the place of the labor struggle, Golden Square. He wants to see the labor movement recommit to being the voice of the worker. The reality of a safe work environment as we rebuild, as we re-energize, in preparation for the transformative environment, society, and workplace. The health and safety in the workplace cannot be sacrificed. Mr. O'Neill presented office assistant Kerry King, who's been with Setu Sab since 2013, with the top award. Wendy Burke, CBC News. 
Well, another person has lost their life on Barbados roads, this time a 75-year-old man. The deceased, a pedestrian, has been identified as Grantley Henderson Skeet, alias Bucky, of number 42 Westwood Park, Husband St. James. He was involved in an accident with a motor lorry owned by the Sanitation Service Authority. Police say the accident occurred along Sugarcane Avenue, Husband St. James, in front of Big V's Snacket and Bar around 11.30 last night. He was pronounced dead at the scene by a medical doctor. A plea for care and compassion for motorists for workers conducting road works and maintenance. Officer in charge of road markings in the Ministry of Transport, Works and Water Resources, Kirk Marshall, suggests this is lacking and motorists need to pay greater attention. His comments come as teams from the ministry have been hard at work day and night in an effort to wrap up the annual school crossing marking program. We certainly have cut signs and cones that indicate that work is going on, but we need people to pay greater attention to, to what is happening and that there are lives present in the center of the road. 90% of the pedestrian crossings near and outside of schools have been remarked. Mr. Marshall said the program commenced in the second half of August and they are hoping to wrap up soon. The school remarking program usually takes around five to six weeks, given good weather. Um, like I said, you, you're expanding because some, even if you go to like St. Joseph, or St. George, the crossings are not close. So you have to drive quite a few miles in order to get to another school. St. Michael is a little bit different because they're close and we can, you know, you can, but you, it's close, which is good, but then you have to contend with traffic. So, so basically that, that is it. Um, at least five weeks to do the entire island. The Christchurch West community is now tsunami ready. It officially received the designation yesterday during a ceremony at the Savannah Hotel. In delivering the feature remarks, Deputy Permanent Secretary Curtis Jiltz called it a practical real-life example of disaster resilience in action and outlined what it means to become tsunami ready. Becoming a tsunami ready community means developing tsunami risk reduction plans, designating and mapping tsunami hazard zones, developing outreach and public education materials, creating public friendly tsunami evacuation maps, and publicly displaying tsunami information. Simply put, it means reducing the vulnerability of at risk coastal communities, promoting, promoting disaster risk advocacy, as well as engendering partnerships and collaboration for change and resilience. Mr. Jokes says the goal now is to be sustainable. What is required of each and every stakeholder within this process and any potential new stakeholders is to ensure that disaster resilience and more specifically resilience to tsunami hazard to the tsunami hazard in this and every coastal community in Barbados is systemic and remains a threat in the fabric of our daily lives. Several needy families in the St. Thomas and St. Joseph areas are to receive much needed assistance from an overseas based group this weekend. The help comes in the form of food and other products, as well as school supplies, just in time for back to school. The Salvation and Praise Tabernacle of North Carolina will be donating approximately 250 food hampers and school items to residents in the two parishes. They're working with the Faith Emmanuel Pentecost Church in Bloomsbury, St. Thomas to distribute the items tomorrow. Barbadian David Watts, the pastor of the U.S.-based church, says he's always had a dream of returning to give back to the community. We will be giving out to um, over a hundred or so people and uh, I really would like to give back to our school that we went to, St. Bernard's School. So we will be donating a whole lot of school supplies to that school to help those that are less fortunate. Pastor Anderson Maynard of Faith Emmanuel Pentecost Church says the assistance is welcomed. We are very thankful for the contribution because we know here 
not only in the church but outside the church there is a need and we are thankful that they could come in and that they have lined up with us in order to make this donation As promised, here's Damien Best with our Friday Night Sports. Damien. Thanks so much, Pearson. Well, Olympian Obadeli Thompson won a runoff vote last night and is now a director of the Barbados Olympic Association. Thompson beat out Dominic Hill at the BOA elections held at the Barbados Hilton Hotel for one of the two director posts up for grabs. They both received 13 votes, forcing a runoff, with Thompson winning 20 to 16. The 47-year-old lawyer will join Trevor Welch, who got 19 votes as the new faces on the board, replacing incumbents Craig Archer and Antonio Wiggins, who received 11 and 12 votes respectively. While speaking to CBC Sports afterwards, the Olympic bronze medalist said helping to develop elite athletes is just one of the areas that he wants to assist with. What I plan to bring to the table is an understanding of what it takes to perform at the highest levels. I was fortunate to win the Olympic bronze medal in 2000 and to make finals at three different Olympic Games. And since retiring, I have been a coach, a mentor, a lawyer, including handling some sports-related issues and a, a parent of children who are deeply involved in sports and have been deeply involved in sports since youth. So all those experiences I plan to use to have discussions with national federations, athletes, and work with other board members to hopefully increase the chances of our athletes performing well regionally and internationally. I think a lot of work needs to be done. Things have improved since I competed as an athlete, but a lot more needs to be done, especially as the world continues to accelerate in its development overall. Another component that I would like to become involved in establishing or making more of a primary focus is high performance. And that high performance has to deal with getting our athletes ready to compete at or near their peak at the bigger competitions. Well, Vice President Cameron Burke, Secretary General Erskine Simmons and Treasurer Orson Simpson were re-elected unopposed. In business tonight, extreme temperatures could induce scarcity and higher prices. That's the word from the Chief Executive Officer of the Barbados Agricultural Society, James Paul. He said the conditions which are not affecting Barbados alone could put the agriculture industry at risk. The price of oranges can actually increase. The oranges, of course, is a commodity that we import and enter into Barbados. And it, again, in that particular example, it shows you that this whole question of, well, they call it climate change, when you can cycle to whatever it is. The point is really, right, that the, the experience that we are seeing right now in terms of these high temperatures, high temperatures that we're experiencing can happen and impact on agricultural commodities, both in terms of the quantities of commodities being produced and, of course, the prices that could arise as a result of the fact that it can induce scarcity of some commodities. Mr. Paul said the laws of demand and supply will also create rationing in the marketplace. If you have factors of heat impacting on the production on the availability of commodities, of course, um, there will be some impact in terms of prices, and that is not something that farmers can control. Um, it just has to do with the laws of demand and supply. Where, and if if you have less uh, less product being available, of course, prices increase um, because what it, it implies is a rationing. There's a rationing market to try to ensure that everybody is able to get. Well, some of you may not want to hear this, but. No sea egg season this year. That's according to Chief Fisheries Officer Dr. Shelly Ann Cox, who has called on Barbadians to refrain from placing orders. She told the business report the decision not to have a sea egg season was taken after consultation with divers across Barbados. Each team from different coasts reported that they are not seeing many individuals. What they have observed are smaller juveniles in areas, especially in the north, um, that are not fully mature. So we really just want to urge the public 
to refrain from placing orders or harvesting sea eggs which are still in the juvenile stage. The fisheries officials said keeping the season closed was ensuring the long-term benefits and sustainability of the sea eggs. Given the high cultural significance and the economic importance of the role of sea eggs as a delicacy, we are putting measures in place to ensure the sustainability of this fishery for present and future generations. Well, you are reminded that there is a penalty for selling, purchasing, or being in possession of sea eggs while the sea egg fishing season is closed. Anyone on summary conviction could face a fine of up to $50,000 and or up to two years in prison. Well, he said he'll be back, and he is, Damien. Thanks so much, Pearson. Well, the Barbados Amateur Bodybuilding and Fitness Federation has selected a 12-member squad to represent the island at the upcoming Central American and Caribbean Bodybuilding and Fitness Federation Championship set for Aruba. The squad for the September 21st to 25th competition reads Timon Howard, Sanaj Lewis, Shaniqua Allenby, Daniel Gill, Julian Belgrave, Trudian Bovell, Michaela Gigi Faria, Rashida Belgrave, Hugo Graves, Gerard Mason, Bukaya Providence, and Ronaldo Bourne. Well, the head coach is Roger Boyce, and assistant coach is Shakira Duglin. Well, defending champions, Deacons men and women experienced contrasting results in the latest round of matches in the senior volleyball preliminaries at the Wildy Gym. Good matchup on the cards. Warren's up against Deacons in fluorescent green. Warren's looking to stamp their authority on the season. Deacons off the slow start here and losing the first set 15-25. More frustration for Deacons in the second. Warrens getting all the breaks off the block. This time and out. 25-15, 25-22 in the first two sets. In the third we go, Deacons turn the tables, operating with a hint more desperation, showing solid resistance in the backcourt and then picking a spot. Warrens caught on their heels. At the end, they were efficient as well. Warren's taking their foot off the gas, perhaps, and Deacons taking advantage to lock the matchup at two sets apiece, 25-23, 25-19. It appeared the fight back pulled all the energy out of the Deacons' camp because in the fifth, they were a shadow of themselves. Warren's rediscovering their winning formula. Great vision. It was all downhill after that. Rian Niles, Matt, and Anisio Wood spearheading the movement. Warrens close up the fifth, 25 to two, five set victory in the bag. There are three men's fixtures. This is Stars in black, playing Chargers. Stars under the microscope, point there to Chargers. Even on defense, they looked entrenched. Big rejection, Chargers snap up the first set, 25-16. Stars might want to look at some video after this performance. Sending three to stop the attack, but there's a huge crack in the wall. Then the laser guided spike from the left. Lethal. Chargers eventually send Stars back in in three straight. 25-16, 25-19, 25-22. Progressive in blue and foundation next up. Foundation had a clean sweep in this one. Brandon Lyons getting a gift. Progressive just going through the motions after the first set. Foundation, a spring in their step. Clinical. This one was over in quick time. 25-22, 25-17, 25-19. Foundation United over Progressive. And finally, on our highlights reel, Cormier in blue and gold versus Deacons. Picks out the net, point Deacons. This was a straightforward assignment. Deacons too much in the first two sets. 25-19, 25-19. It spilled over into the third as well. Deacons romp into victory over Cormier. 25-15 in the end. 
And finally, Barbados Trail hosts Poland 2 0 in their Davis Cup World Group 2 first round tennis encounter. In the first match of the day, Kaipo Marshall lost in straight sets to Poland's number one player, Hubert Herkratz, 6 love, 7 5, in one hour and eight minutes of action. Then, Barbados's number one player, Darian King, lost the second rubber in a three set thriller against Olaf Pegwaski, 6 1 6 7 3 6, in two hours and 28 minutes. King will be back on court tomorrow with partner Hayden Lewis for the doubles, trying to salvage the tie for the visitors, if possible, before the reverse singles. Well, that's our news tonight. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. I'm Pearson Bowen for the crew to all of you. Good night. Have a wonderful weekend.